Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we are joined by Rob Cook. Rob, how are you? Good. Good to hear from you. So this is a great episode. We're going to be talking about the origins of the hi-hat, which is uh, kind of a widely debated topic because a lot of people take claim to um, being the first person to use the hi-hat. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, there's... And as a spoiler alert, we're probably not going to be able to, in the next half hour, pin it down to a certain person at a certain time, but we can certainly uh, uh, bring up most of the the stories, I think, that are are credible, and there's one name in particular that we'll be uh, throwing into the hat that I think uh, deserves uh, mention. Uh, so yeah, there there has been a lot of question about the origin of the hi hat. That's great. Well, I think it's good just to put all the information out there so people know about it. Um, but I think it would probably be a good idea before we uh, get into the stories of the actual hi hat. Would be maybe you'd like to tell people a little bit about what happened before the hi hat, sort of the low boy and the Charleston symbols, um, and just give people a little description of that because I think some people don't know that it started as a little you know eight inch 12 inch symbol off the off the ground exactly um, you can learn a lot from looking at really old catalogs and seeing that oh my gosh they didn't have such and such then but um, at any rate and I let me back up just a little bit more and sure. say a few words about the bass drum pedal um, I, it's not really unfair to simply refer to Ludwig as the inventor of the bass drum pedal, but uh, if you go back and really try to pin it down, uh, it's almost as hard as trying to pin down the origin of the hi-hat. And, and what it really boils down to is the, uh, that it was born out of a need, and there was probably some guy that, that literally uh, <laughs> tied or taped a uh, drumstick to his knee and and hit the uh, drum with it or maybe to his shoe or something uh, because they were hitting it with a beater and then they had a need for hitting it with something else. And uh, boy, were there a lot of really weird pedals in the very early days. There were, there were these contraptions, these overhead things. Some even had a little stirrup. You put your foot in a stirrup and push your foot down and you pulled the beater into the head by doing that. And in retrospect, you know, some of them are pretty comical and ridiculous, but, you know, that that's where it all started. Uh, and then there there were some really goofy, big wooden pedals, real cumbersome and so on. What, what Ludwig uh, claimed, Ludwig really never claimed to have invented the pedal, but uh, because uh, William F. Ludwig Sr. needed a, a pedal to to fit some specific needs and the the pedals out there weren't quite doing it. He did invent uh, a pedal that he could pretty much claim was the first successful portable and usable pedal. He needed something first of all that would go fast, uh, fast enough to play these uh, these circus gigs, and the old pedals weren't weren't doing it. He also needed something portable so it could be folded up and put in the uh, top coat pocket as the drummer dumps on a streetcar with his uh, uh, kick drum and snare drum and on the way to the gig. That's the way the, the chief explained it to me, William F. Ludwig the, the second. Um, but uh, there were lots of other pedals out there and who developed the very first one and the first successful one and so on. Uh, that That's all open for a debate. Um, they, that all predated uh, the whole symbol situation, and as you mentioned, the the low sock pedal was one of the first. Uh, predating that was the old snowshoe type, where it was just two big pieces of wood with a couple pieces of leather. Um, your foot went in the piece of leather on the top piece, and there were the symbols mounted in between the two pieces of wood, and you literally lifted your foot up and down and lifted that top piece of wood with the the symbol attached up and down. And it it didn't take too long for that to develop into the, what most people refer to as the low sock. And now it's kind of like a miniature hi hat. There's a spring attachment. You've got your foot on the pedal. And as you push on the pedal, you're pulling the symbols together. 
uh, and they're they're different incarnations of that, and and they started showing up in different parts of the country at at pretty much the same time, and it might have been from traveling musicians. Uh, certainly, the cat was kind of out of the bag by the time that Clarence Wahlberg of Wahlberg and Auger yeah. uh, added it to his catalog very early on in the, I think, what, 23, something like that. Um, and by the time people are seeing it in the catalog, then they're all over the place. And they, uh, Wahlberg and Auger tended to distribute their hardware not so much directly as through other companies. They they made OEM versions uh, specifically for cer- certain companies, uh, but they were they were pretty much in all the catalogs by the uh, early twenties. Uh, Gretsch, Levy, Ludwig, etc. Um, so now what we're looking at is examining when the low boy uh, became the high hat. And we're talking basically about extending the symbols, so you're still playing them with uh, pushing down on your foot to to draw the two symbols together. But instead of the symbols being down at your by your ankles, they're up, you know, by your waist. Yeah. Um, and one of the the first, it's it's often attributed to Joe Jones, and he wasn't very far off, but. Um, I I would put the Skip Rutherford name up a couple of uh, links on the chain, um, and and that's a name that practically never gets uh, brought into this discussion. But uh, it seems that there were a bunch of people that almost simultaneously experimented with the low boy and started coming up with their own way of raising the the top part up high. And one was certainly uh, Papa Joe Jones. And uh, it was his claim that um, he was inspired by uh, McKinney's Cotton Pickers in 1926. And he liked the concept and and he made his own version of the low boy and raised it up. So there, there's that story. But we're looking post-1926. Um the the Skip Rutherford uh, version, the prototype, um, he was using by 1924 in in the upright version of it. Yeah, uh, and, and he proceeded to use it from 24 to 29 in the incarnation that I have a, a diagram of. Now, and these diagrams can be seen in an article that I wrote for a Drum Magazine that is linked to the Rebeats site on the homepage. If you scroll down, click on the drum magazine cover, uh, there are links to a number of articles and, and there's one on the origins of the hi-hat that, that goes through the uh, Skip Rutherford story and includes these diagrams. But it, it's really kind of interesting how it came to light and kind of a funny story and, and kind of a tragic story. Uh, but what happened was I received back in uh, 1994 a a big packet from my friend uh, Mike Morse. Mike Morse at the time was an international promotions manager, uh, kind of a marketing position with uh, Zildjian. Also for 10 years, uh, Mike was the West Coast artist relations guy. So he was kind of the West Coast version of the uh, John DeChristopher Lenny DiMuzio role. So he was working with a lot of uh, top drummers and accumulating a lot of stories. And he was, he was just an all around great guy. And all of a sudden I would known him since the late seventies. He worked at Marshall music in Lansing, uh, Michigan before he ever, you know, got into the music industry per se. But, uh, but anyhow, uh, I get this big packet from Mike and I open it up and there's page after page after page of text and drawings and notes and everything from this Skip Rutherford. And, uh, I mean, it was his whole life story. The guy went back to how he got interested in percussion in the first uh, place. And a lot of drummers, when you get to talk to them very long, it's not long before you hear what really 
inspired them. Mm-hmm. I can't count the number of people that I've talked to that say it was the Beatles on Ed Sullivan sure. and that night they knew and it, and it flipped on a switch and so on. Uh, William F. Ludwig Sr., it was a, a parade in Chicago. For Skip Rutherford, uh, it was the, a shrine band at the Pasadena Rose Parade. Hmm. And and he knew from that parade on he was going to be a drummer. And uh, he, he uh, had an uncle that encouraged him and even gave him the money to go out. And all he could afford was a pair of cymbals. But he ended up using those cymbals for the next 60 years. I mean, through high school and college, it been a 50-year career. And uh, but, but anyhow, all of this stuff was in this packet and all these pages. And it was a, it had been, I, I called Mike first. I said, what's, what's the deal? And he said, well, <laughs> we don't know. I, he said, this, we got this packet. It was addressed to Armand. And, you know, Armand's a busy guy. He's got a symbol company to run. And it wasn't clear why he got this packet of papers. It, but it goes through this guy's whole life story and has all these drawings and it points out uh, that he he made these prototypes in, in 1922, 1923. He had a working operational hi-hat, wasn't called that, but uh, this working uh, prototype going by uh, 24 mm-hmm. and used that for, you know, five years. Uh, before I went on to other other versions. Anyhow, at Zildjian, they they just didn't know what to do with this. They, <laughs> Armin certainly didn't know what this was all about, and he didn't know what to think. I mean, what do you do with something like that? Do you yeah. respond to the guy? If you respond to him and say, no, you weren't the first, <laughs> then you're just creating a, an adversarial yeah. situation. And if, if you threaten him with litigation, uh, you know, it's a little early for that. And sure. it wasn't clear even what he wanted, if he wanted verification or authentication or royalties, maybe, for all the high hat symbols. Oh, so best man. not to say anything and just pass the buck. So they put it on another guy's desk. <laughs> and it went from desk to desk in the Zildjian offices for over six months. <laughs> <laughs> and, and finally, about the second or third time it came to Mike's desk, he punted and he, he sent it to me. <laughs> and, uh, when I called him for an explanation, he said, we just didn't know what to do with it. We don't know what this guy wants. We don't know what his claim is. Um, we don't know how to verify it. We're not even interested in verifying it. Um, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so I thought, well, I'm going to talk to Skip. This is great because he had his phone number there, and I I'd wanted to talk to Mike first, and and so on. But I thought, well, I'm I'm going to talk to Skip, and uh, this is great because he he talks about still having these symbols, still having these prototype stands, and so on. So I I called him, and I I asked for Skip. This this older lady answers, and I. Uh, she said, he's gone. And uh, she said, they cooked him. <laughs> and well, what do you say? Oh I mean, yeah. I, I said, I, I, I beg your pardon. And, and then she said, they cooked him. And then it, she calmed down a little bit. She was still pretty hot and, and kind of mad, but I had no idea what was going on. Yeah. And, uh, she, she proceeded to tell me a story that, uh, relatives coaxed him into moving and this was, they were in California and it was a 400 mile move to Oregon with his daughter in a U-Haul and it had no air conditioning. Oh. So they got him in this big old truck with no air conditioning and he's an elderly man and it was over a hundred degrees out. He should never have been in the truck and, uh, he, he died of heat, exha- heat exhaustion <laughs> That's basically. Horrible. So, so he was gone and I, I thought, oh man, and all that stuff. So I kind of, uh, raised that subject. I, you know, I said, well, yeah, I introduced myself, explained why I was calling. I said, it, evidently, you know, he still, he, he left all of these symbols and prototypes of the hardware that he had worked on over the years and so on. And, uh, 
she said, oh, yeah, I tossed all that. So in the six months between when he, he worked on this, this, this whole packet and sent it off, and when I was talking to her, she had trashed everything. She had sent, I mean, she didn't save a thing of, of all those prototypes and the symbols oh. themselves, the, the paperwork and everything. It all, it all got tossed. Um, so I still have those diagrams somewhere, the originals that he sent and they're, they're the visuals of them. The most important ones are, are reproduced in that, that article. But, um, we're fortunate that he was he was motivated to uh, to write all that down. Uh, he he may not have been uh, if if his heart would have lasted uh, maybe not quite as long and gone a couple of years sooner or something. But uh, he had some health problems about uh, was it 1988 and and uh, left his drums and cymbals in the van that he or truck he'd used for, to take him to the last gig and never even unloaded him again after that. Um, so I, I, I don't know what she did with those, um, but he had time on his hands because he was no longer gigging and everything. So that kind of explains why he was motivated to sit and think about what he had done and when and, and document it all. And I don't really think he had any, particular motivation he just he just wanted to share his story with the, the folks at Zildjian had but uh, yeah. it's understandable that in their position when you get that kind of claim uh, what do you do <laughs> yeah wow <laughs> but oh my god but anyhow he his, his name certainly should be in the discussion because um, Joe Jones uh, himself uh, claims to have uh, saying it claims to have created his version of the, the hi-hat in 1926. So by that time, Skip had already been using his for a couple of years. And and not in a huge touring situation, but he did have a pretty respectable career. He claims to have played uh, burlesque, uh, every kind of stage, and a lot of dance bands from 15 to 19 pieces, two years with the current Philharmonic. And it was a you know, not a stellar uh, career, but but it was notable. He was out there being seen by a lot of people, and I'm sure his hardware was being seen by by people. And um, like I say, the more people that see it, the more people are inspired to it. They can't buy one just like it, create their own, and so on. Yeah. So um, maybe Papa Joe Jones simply came up with the idea independently, which is quite quite sure. plausible yeah. and had a plumber friend and uh it was an obvious idea to a lot of people at the time man this this is a great little instrument but if i could only have the symbols up here but um if he if he did come up with it on his own someone else had come up with it i think a, a couple of years earlier um now uh, Papa Joe Jones was born in 1911, and there is a, a biography out that I don't have my hands on yet. It was uh, uh, done after he died as a series of uh, interviews and, and so on, I think. And that's uh, still available on uh, Amazon and uh, has more, uh, more personal information. But basically... Uh, he was playing drums at a very young age, uh, and he was a tap dancer, and he was he was performing with uh, carnival shows as a child and so on. But but still, uh, he, he didn't really join the Count Basie band until 1934, when he was uh, uh, about 23. Um, so there are people, or some accounts, uh, crediting Papa Joe Jones as a very young boy being with the the Basie band and then inventing the hi-hat back then. But um, even by his own account, uh, he's saying he created it in 1926. And then, uh, so he would have already had about eight years experience with it by the time he joined the account Basie in 1934. Well, you people would dispute that he mastered it before most other people. (laughs) I mean, so obviously there's a lot of like, debate, but you mentioned before about having a plumber friend. So is there any more information about that? Or do you think that could just be like the most plausible thing of, hey, I've got a plumber friend. Can you do some fitting, take this 
low boy or low sock symbol and just make it higher. I mean, is there any record of that story I, being true at all? I don't think so. Um, it, it maybe it's mentioned in, in some of those uh, uh, articles about him or the, the interview book, but I, I actually, I picked that up from uh, the, the podcast with jazz. So um that that may well be the case, um, but I I haven't seen him quoted on that. Um, you know, Skip was kind of doing his own plumbing there, and I suppose anybody uh, could you know go to the hardware and and start tinkering. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but but yeah, somebody skilled with uh, working with pipes is a it's a logical uh, uh, jump to ask your buddy to do it. Yeah, and now so to talk about what the hi-hat actually looked like at that point in time, because I'm, I'm sure it wasn't like nothing is exactly what we have today. Like basically if you see the old Ludwig pedal, that was the one that you could put in a coat pocket. Um, that doesn't really look like a, you know, a DW 5,000 that we have today. It obviously looks similar. I mean, it's the same type of thing, but the, um, it's just a little bit different. So I'm looking at the uh, diagram that you have of, what would be what Skip invented. And to kind of explain it a little bit, there's almost two, and you can help me out here, there's there's like a lower set of symbols that clamp together uh, down by your feet, and then it says the certain things were added at different times, but then there's a higher symbol that you'd play with your hand. So maybe explain what we would be looking yeah. at for Skip's Skip's invention. Yeah, the first diagram is actually actually goes all the way back to 1922 and he basically has uh, created a low boy. I mean it's a um I don't know how else to describe that. It's a low boy. The symbols that are brought together when you push down on the pedal are at ankle height. Mm -hmm. But what he has done is with that low boy, which other people were were already starting to use at that time, um, I think his first idea was to simply go up with the the pipe that supported the the stationary symbol and go up to waist height, make a ninety, and then add a little symbol holder. So basically, he had his low boy uh, that was being played traditionally, and he had a a little uh, ride crash symbol up on top. Hmm. And then, so that that's diagram one. And, but it, it kind of led him to the concept of, well, hey, wouldn't it be great if, if these two symbols that are being pulled together with my pedal could be happening up here where I have this little symbol mounted at waist height. Yeah. So, so that's the germ of the idea. And then the next two versions that he did and the next two diagrams have the pair of symbols being drawn together up at the top of the post. And the only difference between the two devices, one um, basically has a, a cable that's used to draw the, the symbols together with the, the pedal below. And the other one is kind of a direct pull uh, instead of the uh, the cable coming down straight down and the pipe, the vertical pipe running parallel with it. Got the it. the vertical linkage is inside the vertical pipe. Huh. So very, very similar devices and yeah. both uh, go back to you know the 1924 uh, era. Wow. It's, it's interesting because, um, I think even today when you are watching someone who's brand new set up their drum set, everything's pretty straightforward until you get to the hi-hat. So even today, like with the way it is, um, with the clutch and the rod, it's, it is probably one of the more complex pieces of the drum set, um, as far as setting them up. So this technology being back in 1922, 24, 28, um, I mean, it seems very technologically advanced for its time with the springs. And um, obviously that was kind of piggybacking off of the um, bass drum pedal, which evolved, as you said earlier on in the show. But um, it's pretty advanced stuff. Can you imagine what, what, what kind of licks they would have come out with if they had had our our technology um 
yeah. considering the remarkable stuff they did with those really primitive hats. Yeah. But you're right, and I, I didn't know as I've ever paused to think about that, but yeah, that's the one thing. When you sit down, you, you've just put your kit together, and things have been kicked around on the way to the gig and everything, and you're, you're getting everything just in the right position, and you do a couple of chicks on the hi-hat, and you think, oh my God, that something doesn't feel quite right, exactly. and you realize that the, the clutch is a little bit loose. You don't want it tight and choking things off. Yeah. But all these little things that are a little bit different, maybe the guy that that borrowed them the, for the gig the week before has it really reefed down there, or maybe it's so loose the symbol's about to fall off. Yeah. But if it's not at just the right number of turns and doesn't feel right to you, you're, you're, you're a little bit out of sorts until you get that nailed down. <laughs> yeah, it's all off. Now, let me ask you this too. So, so going back to the low boy, um, what would the function of that be? Would it be a timekeeping sort of thing where you're just kind of clapping along with your foot or what would they be doing with that in just kind of everyday playing? Would it be on, you know, two and four, you're going to play with your left foot or how would that actually be used in the music? I think so. Uh, I think as, as a regular um, accent. I'm probably not the best person to answer that because I'm sure. kind of conjecturing, but um, the, the sock symbol, those little accents and those little choked uh, things and the little quick splashes seem to be coming in at about that time. So, and, the, and there's always people pushing the envelope to, to uh, add that uh, and expand on it, embellish it. Uh, you know, looking for more sounds uh basically to mm. to complement the music but uh the the existence of those little uh, sock symbols led real quickly to yeah the the foot control of same and 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 on from there got it okay now one other thing that i've heard and i'm sure it was in an earlier episode or i might have read it somewhere is that um someone was playing and they dropped a stick and it hit the sock symbol, and they said, oh, man, this sounds good to hit with a stick versus just using your feet. Is that anything you've ever heard? I can't remember where I saw or heard that, but um, mm. it seems hard to prove. Yeah, and I think real early on, there was there was a handheld pair. I mean, it was uh, Sabian did a reissue of those a couple of years ago, and it, it was basically a pair of real small symbols on a uh, a handheld spring thing. I mean, you just uh, close your grasp and you draw the symbols together. So with a stick in the other hand, you could do some really cool things with with that. Yeah. So I I and that was real early on. It may have even predated the 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 low boy kind of a hand sock thing. So um, I think people were hitting them with sticks, you know, from from the earliest days. Got it. Yeah, you give us uh, pretty much any kind of a symbol or anything, and I think a drummer will will hit it. So it's it's all this natural progression. Um, and I just think it's it, what you said about drummers touring around and playing and seeing other people do stuff. It's just how things spread. And this era seemed like if it didn't exist, you had to make it yourself because not that long before this, people were playing snare drums sitting on uh, with no stand. They were playing on a chair. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and that that the very first diagram that we were talking about that has the low boy with an ex, a vertical extension to put a symbol up on top of the low boy. Uh, uh, Rutherford, Skip Rutherford, had taken that lower section to a guy at the Los Angeles drum shop in 1924, and and showed it to him. And the guy Roy Duncan told him that. Well, yeah, uh, I've been making those. I, I have some very similar, and I've been selling them as with my name on them, Duncan. So, so wow. starting al already in 1924, uh, there were other people. It wasn't just uh, Clarence Wahlberg uh, uh, doing the low boy. Um, it turns out Roy Duncan had been selling them, and you know, for every one that he sold and went out, it was probably seen by God knows how many other drummers. And and it just started spreading, so it was kind of a race to see who was going to make a professional version of it that could be made in quantity and 
sold it wholesale. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. No, there's, um, that's a, again, a very common theme. I just minutes ago released the Remo episode, um, where Remo versus Evans and it's this just constant, like multiple people doing the same thing at the same time. It's just who gets to be the biggest and best and first to market. And, um, and honestly, we, we have the, yep. the, um, we're fortunate enough to be able to be in a time now where we can look back and just see how history is written. And it's really, um, you know, who's the biggest and sells the most, it seems like, uh, gains the most attention. Um, now, and I have another question for you, something I don't really understand that I see all the time is, and if I can, I'll try and explain it is really early kind of trap era drum sets with the bass drum and there's the bass drum pedal and it's got like a little symbol hanging next to the, like on the actual bass drum. And then the beater has Uh kind of a, a thing that hits that as well. What's the story with that? Right. I really don't know anything about that. The early symbol with Stryker is something else that seems to appear in in most all of the earliest catalogs at about the same time. If, if you go to the early days of Lady and the earliest Ludwig catalogs and so on, when they first started actually cataloging uh, drum outfits or kits or combinations uh, instead of just individual drums and so on, there would be a bass drum, there would be a snare drum, uh, maybe some uh, uh, wood blocks, you know, temple blocks and so on. But uh, as far as playing the cymbal, the, like you say, the cymbal would be mounted um, on a clamp that would uh, attach to the bass drum hoop. And as you came down at the beater to the head, that little striker would hit the cymbal. Hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, you were, you were pretty much obviously limited to hitting the cymbal every time you hit the bass drum, but it meant more sound and, uh, yeah. uh, and it, it, it caught on and, uh, boy, there's a lot of those out there. They, it was, uh, pretty standard fare for most all of the companies for uh, quite a number of years. Interesting. Yeah, I've always wondered about that. So you're basically, uh, every time you hit the bass drum, you're getting a cymbal. Yeah, yep, exactly. And I think uh, Ludwig had uh, a special pedal that with your foot, you could you could move the footboard sideways or trigger a lever or something to activate uh, that striker. So you could turn it on and off, basically. You could have either just bass drum or you could have bass drum and cymbal. I don't hmm. think there was a setting for cymbal only. Got it. But um, that that was a pretty short-term thing. I think that was in like one catalog or catalog for a couple of years or something. So it was worth a try. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Now with the actual like cymbals themselves, um, to talk about that a little bit, would they have just taken two thin crashes and just modify those to be on um, a sock symbol or was Zildjian or whoever the the maker, let's just call it Zildjian at this point, were they creating um, specific sock symbol symbols, if that makes sense? Would they have just been a smaller kind of thinner symbol that was, you get two and a, you get a pair of them and then um, you put them together kind of like we have today or was it um, anything special? Um. Not at first, but certainly later. Um, for for quite a while, um, in the early days of uh, well, the, the the first drum catalogs that were out, you could only buy cymbals in pairs. Um, and I'm talking about before the sock cymbals even started showing up, uh, because cymbals were always played by the cymbal player, and you you bought a pair, and there were your options were about you know four or five. Uh, diameters and they and they weren't different weights or anything yeah. um but you you simply bought a pair of cymbals and so that's what they were probably working with and and skip rutherford do it again when he didn't have the money to buy a uh a drum set or a bass drum and a snare drum etc but he did get the money to get a pair of cymbals and those became multi-use they were yeah. 15 inch k's and uh, those became his hi-hats later. But I, I imagine a lot of those early um, homemade contraptions that drummers were using 
they were using stock marching symbols and probably pretty darn heavy. Yeah. Um, it, it wasn't uh, going to be until, oh, geez, I'd have to look up the, the dates, but it was still a, a few years away from symbols being uh, available individually and also being crafted for specific applications. Probably among the first were the socks, the sock symbols, because mm. they were going to have that, that little handheld device and and they were uh, small enough that they were easy to put on that, the lightweight um, first versions of the, the sock pedal and so on. Got it. Yeah. Now, l- let me ask you this. So I'm assuming that the term sock symbol is called that because it's down by your feet, sock, you know, feet. Where does hi-hat come from? I have my, my guess, and I think I've read somewhere, is that the old symbols had a big, bigger bell that would look like a hat and it was raised up higher, so it was a high hat. Am I slightly correct? I don't know. I I don't know where the word hat enters into the whole thing. Okay. I would have thought low boy and then the high boy, and, <laughs> and I'm from there, but yeah. that one I, I don't have an insight on. <laughs> okay. Well, that's funny. I mean, I guess it's just, it's these things that just happen over the, you know, I would... I wonder if anyone actually really knows the history. But you know, now that you mention it, it's a funny story. I, I once we once had um, who's the singer from the Love Boat um, show? Uh, God, I'm blanking out on his name. Once, uh, anyhow, he was at the casino where I was doing the video work, and he. <laughs> He kept taking his position on on the stage right in front of the drum set and in a way that when our front remote controlled camera came in on him, the ride symbol was constantly right over his head and it looked like he had a great big Chinese hat on. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. We were, we were getting quite a, quite a kick out of it in the production office. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it looked just plain ridiculous, <laughs> but it... it that symbol looked like a big hat. Yeah. And, uh, I'm sure it had nothing to do with how high hat got its name. But, <laughs> no, uh, it might though. Cause... A flashback to that guy. <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I know I've read that somewhere where it was like, Oh, it had a bigger, you know, bell and it looked like a hat. And, um, but literally all it takes is yeah. someone writing that on the internet and, um, or someone saying it on a <laughs> podcast and people hearing it and then repeating it. <laughs> so we might be yep. <laughs> altering that, but, um, well, yeah, that's cool. Cause so then just to, to kind of move it forward with the evolution of the hi-hat, when did it become like every single drummer is using a hi-hat? Like you, you even see the early Gene Krupa stuff. Um, would that be like thirties and forties? It became sort of a, a, a household item. Yeah, I would think at least, uh, uh, well back to with, uh, Papa Joe really hitting his stride. I mean, he had already been working on it for eight years before he, he joined uh, uh, Count Basie. But Basie certainly would have would have been a huge um, uh, ex, uh, exposure point for the hi hat because the guy was really good. Yeah. People were were imitating him by this point and and hanging on his every uh, stick motion, uh, and certainly. Yeah, all of a sudden everybody would need one, and and they were readily available by that point too. I mean, they had already been in the Wahlberg and Ajay catalog for what six or eight years by that mm-hmm. point. So, yeah, they were they were readily available, and people were seeing them, and uh, yeah, there was no looking back. I mean, now it's you can't have a drum set without a hi hat, basically. So it's uh, clearly proven to be a, a massive part of the drum set. It's integral to playing the drums. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. There's a, um, uh, I think a lot of, uh, drummers, if, uh, limited in the number of pieces they could take to the desert island, you, you'd need a snare <laughs> kick and a hat first exactly. and then, <laughs> then go from there. Yeah. <laughs> and then maybe a floor Tom, maybe a Tom. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. So, um, Rob, I think we should take the last bit of the show here to, um, obviously talk about the Chicago drum show, which is your, your baby. And, um, I can say, I was talking on the phone before. I can say firsthand that um, last year was my first time going, and it is an experience like no other. Like, it's hard to explain how um, it's just as if 
the Facebook groups and Instagram and all of these places where we talk with other drummers, just it's real. It became real life um, to get to meet everyone who you talk to online and um, just an unbelievable experience. Um, so, and you're coming up on the 30th year this year. Yep, yep. Um, we uh, added the uh, subtitle of the drummer's family reunion because um, so many people are so gratified to spend two days with a bunch of people who whose eyes don't glaze over when they start debating whether it was a three eighths or a seven sixteenths uh, washer in such and such a year. Yeah. <laughs> so I, mean, I, you know, they're all from. A lot of them are from small towns where, or even households where, you know, people don't want to hear about that. Oh yeah, we're <laughs> but, all there. <laughs> but it's a place where, where you can go and, and intersect. And uh, yeah, there, we have uh, uh, a forum that uh, has a booth because it's a place for them to all gather. Uh, another forum, actually a second forum that has a booth is the Rogers group. And yeah. they, they even bring in a big overstuffed chair and make it a, <laughs> make it a hangout and, yeah. and so on. So, um, you know, it, it seems like every year I, I get calls from people asking about the show and what it's like and what to expect. And, uh, in, in talking to them for 10 minutes or so and, and getting a feel for where they're coming from, I can pretty much assure them, look, in the first half hour, you're going to feel like you've been coming for 10 or 15 years. Exactly. Uh, especially if you've been in the industry for a little while, you're going to be running the old friends and making, making new friends and, and uh, running into people you've, you've heard about or have, have emailed to and, and so on. And um, it, it's its own best marketing tool. As long as I, I kind of guide it and, and set the ground rules and facilitate it, um, then it just kind of happens. <laughs> yeah. It's very well run. I mean, just for everyone of all ages, it was like, um, I mean, I just, so many of the guests I've had on the show were people were there and it's just, you're putting faces mm-hmm. to these names. And, and like you said, it's, it's the people who have collections in their houses who just want to sell some of their gear or maybe even just have a booth so they can have a place to hang out up to like Zildjian and newer brands, obviously like a and F or like I said, I met Remo there, um, which turned into an episode. I think if anyone is involved in the drum world, it's very much worth, worth going. And it is in Chicago. Well, I guess it's in, why don't you give us the, uh, the details. Uh, Villa park. Okay. Yeah. Villa park. Uh, for years we were at a county fairgrounds in St. Charles and it was a little bit more intimate setting, but, um, when we got up to, you know, an arena, uh, 20,000 square feet, uh, we, we just had to have a larger place to facilitate shipping, uh, product to the show and so on. And the silver lining of the move was that we're closer to the airport now. So, uh, we're literally a 15 minute cab ride from the airport or you can take uh, uh, public transportation from downtown Chicago uh, uh, to get there also or get to the vicinity of, of the show. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Villa Park, Illinois. It's always the weekend between Mother's Day and Memorial Day, um, which in 2020 falls on the 16th and 17th of May. Okay. Uh, and uh, we try to make it uh, both a, a entertainment and educational event. I mean, the, the, there's still the the uh, swap meet aspect. A lot of people come to pick up specific used instruments or to trade or uh, consign uh, instruments or hardware or memorabilia, etc. Um, and then there's, of course, the the person, the people aspect, the, the reunion, but uh, we we have uh, free clinics, uh, and we we try to bring in uh, notable artists, uh, people that are going to attract uh, more people to the show, obviously because of a high profile. Sure. And the artists uh, love the hang. Uh, many of them are asked to come back over and over again, and we we can't. You know, I always have a lot of repeats. We try to get some new names. <laughs> yeah. in. Uh, yeah. At this point, uh, for for 2020, we've confirmed uh, Kofi Baker oh, and wow. cool. Mike Clark and Greg Potter. 
Nice. And uh, we'll end up with probably six, maybe seven. There are about six or seven really high-profile artists that we're, we're talking to. Most would love to be there, but are unable to confirm until like January. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's when I need the confirmation because of the print ad schedule and so on. And, yeah. and uh, unfortunately, some some people, because of the vagaries of their touring schedule and so on, really aren't able to ever confirm until the week before, and it it makes it hard to advertise and so on. Yeah. But anyhow, uh, in addition to being really accessible. At, at the show, uh, a lot of the clinicians also uh, do master classes, and there's there's an extra charge for that. But and we limit it to 25 people, but it it gives people an, a chance to get real close to uh, really high profile drummers and and pick their brain and get some personal instruction. Hmm, man, I mean, it is an experience like nothing else, and. Um... Just the people you bump into walking down the aisles, and there's lots of like on YouTube. I posted one. There's lots of um, Steve Maxwell has some. There's lots of walkthroughs where you can see, and that's what got me. Like, I have got to go to this thing. Um, and many people refer to it as the best drum show in the in America, maybe even in the world, um, just because of that uh, that camaraderie and that that community. And you could be. You could have played the drums for a day. I feel like you could be not even a drummer, just interested in you know learning, or you could have played your entire life, and everyone will treat you great and um, become your friend pretty much instantly. So, you put on a good show, Rob. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, again, I'm I consider myself more of a facilitator than than anything else. I just try to bring everybody together, and and my my crew is fantastic uh some of them i've known since high school so 50 years nice. uh and others are fairly recent but uh we we come with a crew of about a dozen 12 to 15 people that i bring down from michigan and then a, a bunch more local people uh a lot of volunteers and so on but um they're all really great people i i think uh anyone there I, I trust implicitly to handle most any problem or question, and and I get a lot of compliments on that. But um, I, I'm really uh, gratified that over the years I've been able to bump up what was a no pay weekend <laughs> to yeah. almost being like a regular gig now because it, it's it's definitely worth it. There there are, um, any any business person will tell you that you know HR is one of their main concerns and. Sure and their personnel are their most valuable resource, but uh, even more so at the drum show, I, I really depend on, on a really great group of people. It's, it's very much a family. Wow. Well, I plan on, um, last year I was there, um, I shared a booth with my friend Vincent from Vitalizer Drums, who sells um, Speed King pedals that he redoes, and I plan to be there again this year in some capacity. I'll probably share a booth with him again, and... Um, I will give you more heads up so I can actually be associated with the uh, print stuff and uh, and I'm just yeah. really looking yeah. forward to it. So, Rob, I always love having you on the show and this will not be the last time because you're such a great resource and um, everyone refers to you all the time as kind of the, the king of drum history. So, great to have you here. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Keep up the great work, man. I'm, I'm learning something with uh, every episode. Uh, there's oh, that's awesome. really good stuff. And- and I, sometimes I make mental notes and, well, that was close, but I wish they would have covered such and such. So maybe sometime we'll do a, a tighten up episode and cover some of the lost chapters. But, yes. Um, man, there's been some great stuff. I would encourage people to go back and listen to Joe Luomas a couple of times because yeah. he's one of the guys that really nailed it all the way through the entire um, iteration of, uh, of Canco. Um, I really liked what Mark Cooper had. Uh, to say about Slingerland, um, I think uh, maybe some of the the latter chapters of Slingerland, which some people would barely even consider vintage, but she's already thirty years has gone by. Yeah. But uh, anyhow, the you know the HSS era with Buzz King and and so on could could use mentioning. But sure. But uh, man, I I look forward to every episode, and I'm I'm learning a lot. Well, that's great. And that means a lot coming from you. And um, I think you're absolutely right. What we will do is a an episode where we go ahead and just kind of 
update and touch on things because, again, what I've learned is you can't hit every single thing in every episode. Um, I typically get responses from people on Facebook. And um, I just love how everyone, though, is very, um, I don't know what to say. I would say polite and very uh, positive. Mm -hmm. Like, this is great, but I think you might have missed this. So um, I welcome that. So we'll we'll Mm -hmm. do that a little bit down the road and get you back on and um, and kind of fill in some some holes. Great, great. Well, keep up the great work, man. Thanks, Rob. If I don't talk to you soon, I'll I'll see you at the drum show in May. Yep, yep. All right, bye, Rob. We'll see you, Bart. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History, and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.